Hello and welcome to Grow Conversations, your window into the world of medical cannabis here in the United Kingdom. My name is Alex Fraser and I'm your host. And on today's episode, we have the wonderful Dr. Dave Howells and Sam Ashton of Cannabis Clinic Cardiff. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's so great, great to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, I guess to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about the clinic itself? Just, you know, broad strokes. What's the sort of vibe of the of the clinic? What do you guys what do you guys do? Well, we, you know, love our patients. We feel that, you know, our patients are the, the central figures to why, you know, we are here. Uh, we have great empathy with the struggles that they go through. Um, we know that, you know, the, the medicines that are available, whilst they certainly have their place, are not the whole story in terms of promoting wellness and integrating into their lives. Um, there is so much unmet need out there for different approaches. And, you know, the successes we have seen uh, have just been, you know, sort of amazing. We've, you know, been privileged to be able to help people, to guide them in many ways uh, with medicines they already know. And in some cases where they're, they've come to a, a position whereby they've tried everything else. And to say it's, it's an honor to be able to, to assist them on this journey and take them to a place whereby, you know, they, they come back and say, this is life changing. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that is phenomenal. It's in, so rewarding that, you know, why wouldn't we do this and want to have, you know, this available for more people? And that that's our central philosophy is, you know, this is a message that that needs to get out there. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, you guys are one of the more vocal, I suppose. Having cannabis in the name of the clinic is quite unique, isn't it? So that I know that, you know, you're you're very much transparent about what you're doing. There's no pretending like it's something else, no hiding behind it. This is cannabis. Deal with it. And I, I have a huge amount of respect for anybody who comes with that sort of complete transparency. Let's not pander to the stigma or the judgment or any of that. Let's just put the put our cards on the table. And I think it's particularly interesting. And what I was going to say was because you're a psychiatrist, so we're talking about mental health here, uh, and that's that's solely what you do with with Cannabis Clinic Cardiff. It's all mental health. Yep. Um, you know, as a psychiatrist, you know, this is something we've put together. You can only work within your sphere of expertise. Mm -hmm. I would love nothing more that this was a simple tool you could add on to all the other tools I've learned throughout my career. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case, and you know the demand is such that this is the biggest bang for my you know professional buck. This is the way I can make the most uh, impact in the world, promoting this as a medicine when there are so many you know needy patients and there are so few clinicians willing to to put their head above the parapet and and do this. So in many ways, I think. I need to put my, my stake in the ground and go, at the moment, you know, we need to make sure cannabis gets out there to a sufficient number of people such that um, ultimately everyone will know someone who has benefited from medical cannabis. Hmm. And then that can be a tipping point whereby it becomes mainstream and more accepted. And, and yes, it can be integrated. You know, ultimately, cannabis clinics, you know, will not be um solely doing things with cannabis you know mm -hmm. they will be having conventional medications and hopefully more novel therapeutic interventions in the in the coming days and, and years but i think we're a long way off and at the moment we just need to to put our stake in the ground and say this is what we are this is what we're doing and it works yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I mean we'll we'll talk a bit about some of the success stories I think that you've seen. I'd be really interesting to hear um where you feel like that that the most value is, I suppose, amongst the patient cohort that you that you talk to. But before we do, how how did you initially discover medical cannabis as a concept? How did that was that something you were always aware of? Were you watching North America or is this something that was relatively new and you just went, Oh, I need to be doing this? Well, that was me. Um I well, I'll openly admit I come from the recreational market I, I did it as a youngster as as many of us have <laughs> for fun mm -hmm. um I got really really sick around 2003 um it took over a year to get a diagnosis and in 2004 I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease 
Um, and that just, as you know, upheaved your whole life. It destroyed my physical, my mental health. Um, it destroyed my social life. I, I lost my career. I couldn't work anymore. And one of the symptoms that I really, really struggled with was vomiting, nausea and vomiting all the time. I lost lots of weight. And somewhere, and I can't even remember how it came about, but somewhere along the line, I started to put a little bit of cannabis flour in a little pipe. And I used to think myself off into the ensuite. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only thing I found really effective for nausea. And then, of course, you start to realize that it really helps you with your mood. And mm. when you're like sort of stuck at home all day and you're suffering from chronic fatigue and stuff, it just makes life so much better. And then in 2010, I had my daughter by then. In 2010, I was that sick. Uh, we had to have family members come and look after my daughter for me for six mm. months, and it, it resulted in me having surgery. Uh, and I got well. And it was like after, what, seven, eight years of being really unwell, I found what it was like to be well again. And I think you might understand this. You forget what it's like to be a healthy person. Yeah. And uh, we had a discussion, didn't we? Because during all this, obviously, Dave has done lots of research into Crohn's. He's become his own little expert into Sam's Crohn's. Mm. Um, and we looked at all different conventions. I mean, at one point, you were going to make me pig worms, weren't you? Yeah, and intestinal pig parasites um, at, at phenomenal cost from Germany, I think it was. And, mm -hmm. That's know, a new the... one to me. That is yeah, a new yeah. one. Yeah. Well, Shipping worms from Germany. Yeah. yeah. And how does, one, how does one ingest these worms? How does this... I don't think we got that far, but okay. um, you know, there's okay. uh, some limited research into you know the the hygiene hypothesis that you know I suppose once upon a time people the Crohn's were pig farmers and you know they they automatically had these worms and that was a a sort of immune module immunomodulator maybe mm. uh, but des desperation and th this is the oh. thing when people are desperate they they look at desperate options and mm. I, I completely empathise with people who are in that position. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad we didn't. Kate, I didn't have to eat pig worms, uh, and cannabis was the solution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God there was a better option. Thank God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but after surgery, I, I did say, and I stopped cannabis for three, four months, and it was a discussion between us, because at this mm. point, Dave had done a lot of, of research into it uh, and was a real like believer in the anti-inflammatory things, and he's like, keep it going, keep it going. And this is putting me at risk. I was a young mum at the time, uh, and I was at risk, uh, and it was really awful. It was like I had to pretend to be someone else when I was with my mum friends at school gate and stuff, uh, and, mm. and that was really, really challenging, but it kept me well. Uh, and over the years, I've pretty much been in remission now for 14 years, except for the odd blip where I've had to go back and I've had the old testing stuff. But I've never had my inflammation markers up. They've always been within range. And I've always got over my blips with cannabis and no other medication for Crohn's. Wow. Wow. So for me, I am a true believer that this is a medicine that works really, really well for me for Crohn's disease. It manages my anxiety, which is a symptom of my Crohn's disease. And one of the massive things that happened to me is when I went, uh, finally got a prescription, when we found out, oh, my God, it's legal. Mm. Um, I got my first prescription and I got a prescription of uh, THC oil. And that was a game changer for me, because one of the things that I would still suffer from would be intermittent bouts of chronic fatigue, like two, three days. Of just going, I just can't do anything. Yeah. And that stopped. Mm. And that's on a regular dose every day of cannabis oil that stopped that. Amazing. Amazing. It's, uh, I mean, so fantastic to hear the, the, the personal experiences. It seems to be almost every episode this comes up. And I think it is something about the cannabis industry wherein it's something that's been a, available and around for so long that there's a, a, enough of us that have found it, realized the benefits long before we were aware of a legal option to be prescribed or, or in your case, prescribe it. How did you discover that? How did you discover it was legally available? When did that happen? Well, <laughs> it was one of those eureka moments. Um, I was working on another project um, cultivating CBD flower in Central Africa. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, beforehand. Um, and I was doing a lot of research and I came across a webinar. And it was, a, I think it was a day conference, but I think it was uh, Professor Mike Barnes on it. Uh, and we knew, we knew about David Nutt, we knew about Mike Barnes and stuff, but I don't think we'd connected the dots and I do think I did around 2018 speak to my gastro consultant and say, can you prescribe it? So I think I must have had an inkling, but I didn't connect it. 
And mm. then it was there where it was like, right, you can get through a private clinic. Um, you can do this. And I was like, oh, gosh, Dave. So I showed you, didn't I? And watched it. And it was like one of those things where I'm going to go and find a clinic so I can get my prescription. And Dave's going, I'm going to find a clinic so I can prescribe. Because if someone's going to prescribe for you, I want to prescribe for other people. I found a clinic really quickly. Yeah, and and I I, I struggled. I mean, I, I contacted a, a couple, and you know, the there there wasn't much uptake or or interest in um you know me me coming on board at that point. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I just continued to do research in the background, got in touch with drug science, and you know, had chats with them. And uh, ultimately, you know, I figured, well, you know, let's see if we can do something in in Wales and. That, that led you know down a rabbit hole of of many months of research into this area and thinking well well actually you know i've got the qualifications and the experience and uh, you know I, I can start doing this and um yeah we we started doing this sort of evenings and and weekends and it, it snowballed in that you know patients were coming back and saying this is this is life changing this is amazing thank you ever so much and, Sometimes it was just the mere legality and the relief of anxiety of, of being a criminal. Mm. Um, but over and above that, it appeared that, you know, this was actually working for a, a vast array of people. Mm. Um, and throughout my 20 year experience in the NHS, I'd never had results like that where patients would come back after a month and say, doctor, you know, the medicine you've given me has, has changed my life. Um, and, you know, there's only so long you can you know, sort of hold out against that that kind of service. Um and to be able to to give that to someone else and, you know, feel the you know, the gratitude for someone else doing that for my wife, mm. you know, that just resonated me in a, a very important way. Yeah. Yeah. Something that you you knew was so impactful because of your experience, because of Sam's experience. And mm-hmm. um yeah, and and you know, kudos to you for sticking with it and getting involved because it sounds like it wasn't immediately like, well, you weren't just welcomed in with open arms and it's so it's uh, uh which which is surprising to me if you to be honest because around that time i think we would we were desperate for more prescribers but perhaps we hadn't yeah. been introduced perhaps there hadn't been that that connection yet but um i'm glad you got it sorted eventually absolutely and possibly for the better in the long term in that you didn't just you know join one of the pre-existing clinics but actually decided to carve your own path and and set up your own clinic um how did how did that come about i mean was that were you particularly nervous about doing it for yourself? Was there a, a desire to do it independently, or was that you know was that a more of a concern, and it was sort of out of a needs must kind of element to it? Yeah, there's definitely a yeah. need, need, needs yeah. must, and yeah. you know, once you start exploring this and understanding the the regulations and um, you know setting up a, a system whereby you, you can see patients regularly, um, you know, you you become an unintentional business owner. You know, you you don't start out, you don't think, I know I'm going to set up, you know, a, a cannabis clinic. You go, well, I've got, you know, patients I need to service. Yeah. There has to be a structure involved with it. You know, you look at all different sort of models mm-hmm. of how you might deliver that service. And, and ultimately, that leads you down the path of, of having to set up a business, essentially. Um, you know, I'm, I'm NHS through and through. You know, I'm, I'm very much, you know, love the model that the NHS gives and to find myself on on the private side of medicine is is more of a surprise to me than anyone else um I truly believed I would be in the NHS till my you know sort of uh, golden watch and gong and retirement days um and I was you know wanting to to help build the NHS back to you know the the position it should be and that, that's ultimately what I would want is, you know, for this to be integrated into mainstream medicine. Mm. I'd love nothing more than that. Mm. It's yeah. sad that we're at the point where it's potentially what you're doing currently with the clinic. And you mentioned earlier that awareness and just making sure the word gets out there um, is potentially more important than than pushing into the NHS and trying to force square peg into a round hole. that's not not currently ready for it or is waiting clinical trials. I'm sure we can. We can talk and delve into why the NHS isn't prescribing a little bit later on, but I'd love to understand, you know, when you started out, um, presumably you're still doing work in the NHS, mm-hmm. um, what did your colleagues think about the idea that you'd launched a, a cannabis clinic? Um, well, the, this is something which, you know, comes along very slowly, you know, I mm-hmm. you know, became interested in it, you know, I'd 
very freely talk to people about it and um you know step by step and on the on the large, large part everyone is is very interested and intrigued you know everyone wants the best for patients and if there's a, a tool out there to do it then great and the the barrier perhaps is is when you know these are unlicensed medications without the evidence base to justify its use within the the confines of that nhs mm. nice guidance um you know evidence based medicine it, this this is a the major problem because it doesn't fit in that you know sort mm. of uh, mm. square peg round hole um but on the whole 99% of people i would say we're interested and, you know, I think can see the way that, you know, medicine is moving towards this. You know, we're, we're, we're an island, but we're, we're part of the world and we can see that, you know, there are other places in the world that have done this very su successfully or, you know, with, with obviously various problems across the world. But mm. um, this is the way, this is the direction of travel. Um, but it's, it's rare for people to go outside their comfort zone to to think well how can i integrate this because they're so busy within the nhs doing everything that the nhs needs to do mm. you know these are people who are doing very meaningful rewarding mm. jobs and you know they they know how to do it within that structure which which is fabulous and you know to think well can we do this differently should we do this differently um you know how important is this until you have direct experience, you don't realize that actually this is a game changer. Yeah. You know, that this this shakes up everything. You can't blame other clinicians for, for not engaging is what you're saying, I suppose, because it is complicated, not just uh, because it's cannabis and there's stigma and there's a you know misconceptions and things you might have to deal with, but because the regulatory system for it's actually quite difficult too. Did it take you a long time to get the clinic set up for that reason? Was that something that you struggled with or was that relatively quick and easy? It took us a fair few months because I think we, we started talking about this. We, we saw our first patient in November 2021. Um, and I think it was around, correct me if I'm wrong, around the March. We had our, we, we discovered we could do it. And then we did a lot of work. We spoke to people politically in Wales to make sure that we weren't going to get you know, into trouble. Uh, you spoke to a lot of your colleagues. Um, we, did a, we got the team together. Um, yeah. And then it was like, we remember the conversation going, the you know, between us two and Matt. Matt, Dr. Matt Hoskins is our other consultant psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and going, what do we call it? Mm. And that's how Cannabis Clinic Cardiff came up. You're lucky it wasn't a Welsh word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you could have picked um, that on promotional and, material there. Yeah, and we have what we say on the tin, but don't get me wrong, it's causes a lot of bother in terms of, you mm. know, we have rejected emails and going mm. spam and, mm. and stuff like that. So, you know, if, if I was going to give advice to any cannabis clinics going forward, perhaps don't put cannabis in the title of your <laughs> clinic. <laughs> do, you think you'll, do you think you'll change the name or do you think you're, you're stuck with it now? It's a, it's a recognised brand. We've done, we did a patient survey in the new year. Okay. Um, because we've got uh, things that we, we have to find out and we've got some policies that we have to implement and we're sure. letting the patients lead that. Great. Um, and they've come back with some fantastic results, haven't they? Mm -hmm. And one of the questions we asked them was about the name. And can you remember offhand? Yeah, I mean, over 50% said stick with Canvas Clinic Cardiff. Um, the... There, there were a few other suggestions which were. Well, there's some were, really good suggestions, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, maybe we should have gone for that, you know. <laughs> and, and maybe we will, but you know, yeah. at, the, at the moment, you know, the, there doesn't seem to be any great motivation from patients or, or ourselves to do so. I know that the industry as a whole wants to move away from that model, um, but as I say, at, at the moment, it, it's really in its infancy. The we, we've just got to be true and honest to, to who we are and what we do at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that shines through, doesn't it? I was going to say, don't don't lose the name yet because there is such a, or if you do change it, you need to do one of those PR campaigns that makes it very clear that Twitter is now called X or whatever, you know. Um, not that that particular example went well, but um, <laughs> sorry, Elon, sorry. Um, but, uh, but it's a, a fan, I know. Yeah, um, he's watching now. <laughs> because, because you guys have a, have a really positive reputation, unlike Elon, but you have a really positive reputation. <laughs> yeah, like, we'll, we'll stop, we'll stop bullying, we'll stop punching way up. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so I've completely distracted me and lost my life <laughs> entirely. Um, no, yeah, because you do, you do, you have a fantastic reputation. I know from the patients I talk to that you guys are, you know, so well respected in this space. It's it's a unique reputation too, because we have clinics that are linked to, you know, big American corporations, big producers from the US. Uh, we have clinics that are linked to some of the bigger UK pharmacies. Um, you guys are very much sort of, and you know, on the face of it, and tell me if I'm wrong, certainly it looks like a very sort of independent, family run, uh, you know, very personalized human level of care, which is, you know, not just in cannabis, but generally in medicine seems to be, you know, very unusual these days. Um, and I know that, you know, the patients that are with you are, uh, you know, they're hardened fans at this point. <laughs> Aww, it's so lovely, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we wanted to, um, you know, we want to be personal, but we, we did this, well, as you can see from grassroots, we've grown it organically. We, mm -hmm. The last two, three years, we've been, we've been learning the trade and building our brand. Um, and we've always wanted to maintain a kindness and a compassion and that when people come to us, they, they're going to get the service and we're going to, you know, do the best we can for them. We're not linked to, to anyone. I mean, we have good working relationships with, you know, I think all, mm -hmm. all the pharmacies um and you know within the industry and things and we just want to do what the patient wants and we're patient-led well, they're the ones who make the decisions i think the the central philosophy was you know we wanted to create a service which you know sam would want to belong yeah. to and that's the litmus test you know is would sam <laughs> want to be a, a a patient at our clinic and the, the great irony is, is that this is the one clinic she she, she can't be a member of because because mental health and she, and you're you're on the IBD side of things. Who's this? That we're, who's this that's joined us? This is Dexter. Uh, Dexter, we are Dexter's human therapy. <laughs> therapy people. Yes. Therapy people. Um, he's, he's, he's support one... humans. Yes. Yeah, we support humans. He has been training us very effectively for the last eight years, and he decides what he does and when he does it. He, he, he can tell us when he wants treats and when he wants to go for walks. And uh, a lot of patients will sometimes see this little furry creature in the... Yeah, he very often just sits, sits on my lap and just sort of stares around. Yeah. And... I was going to say, is this, a, is this a cameo appearance for Dexter? Are we going to have all the, all the Dexter fans now in the comments? <laughs> being like, oh, I remember... Dexter, yeah, say hello to your fans. <laughs> oh, he's yeah. a sweetie. He is a sweetie. We do. We love our Dexie. I mean, Everyone should have this much love in their life. I'm just the, the picture in front of me. This, uh, yeah, I can't get my foot, but the, the, you guys, <laughs> I, we haven't even covered the fact that you're a, you're a couple. We didn't, I don't think no. we've even said oh, that. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> we've been married. We celebrated our 21st wedding anniversary in January wow, by going over to Brighton and I did a talk for women on menopause and medical cannabis because we just like, we rock that way, yeah. don't we? <laughs> <laughs> What a way to celebrate. We could be Brighton to celebrate. Yeah, first time is fabulous. Love yeah, we Brighton. loved it. We're going back, aren't we? Totally. You've never been before. Wow. No, okay. no, no. I spent 10 years in Brighton. That's my, my stomping ground. So now I'm glad you yeah, were I glad it was a good place to, Where are you going? to celebrate. Yeah. He's done his up. appearance now. He's had enough. Fair enough. I don't blame him. I'm, you know, <laughs> you're not myself at this point. Um, got some uh, snoozing to do. You've worn him out. <laughs> haven't we all, eh? Um, Sounds terrible that they're not, the, the viewers won't know that we're also recording this on a Saturday morning. This is all, uh, and, and it, it, it follows on perfectly because you're just saying about, you know, celebrate you're doing an anniversary, but you're also doing a talk about cannabis and menopause. Do you ever switch off from the cannabis side of your lives now? Well, I, um, I live it, I breathe it, I inhale it. Uh, it glues me together on a, a daily basis. So for me, no. Um, but no, we, it has become... We we have to do better at getting out and not working all the time. True. Yeah, yeah. We need we because because we've been we've just started to take on and employ and grow the team, and that's what our aim is this year. But up until then, we were everything, weren't we? Yeah, and you know you you have to look after your your own health, and you know I when I was in the NHS, uh, um, the, one of the last roles I had was a VMA chair. And, you know, avoiding burnout, looking after doctors was mm. my sort of central tenant because I, I knew basically from the evidence and from experience that the best way to look after patients is to look after the staff. Mm. You know, you, you have to keep these people glued together. And, you know, through COVID, that was ever so more important. And, 
you know the the staff are the you know the ult- utter heroes of, of the NHS and the amount of unpaid unrecognized work they do is phenomenal and and so that was what I viewed as then my professional bang for buck is looking after doctors and other health professionals um, to make sure that patients got the best healthcare. Um, and, you know, to, to leave that was, was sad, you know, and, you know, I, I really, you know, wish that, you know, the, the NHS could get the recognition and funding that it, that it desperately needs. Um, and, you know, to, to be outside of that, looking in, whilst you've got all of these, you know, different sort of uh, things going on. I mean, there's, there's lots of sort of striking and resource issues, um, you know, that that does make me sad. And if I was still in the NHS, I would be championing that cause. But, you know, I, I've come to a, a different area where I think my skill set is is at the moment fairly unique in being able to help patients in that way. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a balance of, you know, where do you put your time and energy and, you know. And he's putting a lot of time and energy <laughs> seven days a week. I mean, I've tried to implement yeah. a 10 o'clock at night ban for work. <laughs> and he's really rebellious. <laughs> really rebellious. Yeah, really, a, 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 a psychiatrist that prescribes cannabis is a bit rebellious. <laughs> <laughs> Who thought? Who knew? <laughs> Let's let's talk a little bit about the the patients that you see, Dave. We won't obviously go name any names or go into think, oh. anything specific, but anecdotally speaking, you, you know, this as you said, sort of the most impact that you can have on patients' lives. If you let's say you were forced to niche into one or two disease areas in in psychiatry, where would you see the most value in in cannabis prescribing? Is there, you know, where where do you see the real life changing think- impact? Yeah, I think you you can you can boil it down to to one very central um, symptom. It's it's anxiety. That's where the the academic research base is, and that's like the 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 behaviour or the tip of the iceberg with everything else underneath it. So you can have anxiety because you've um, you know you've got post traumatic stress disorder. You can have you know anxiety that's related to health or panic disorder or social anxiety um you can have adhd leading to anxiety um menopause can, menopause substance misuse you know there, there's so many strands which anxiety is a key mm. symptom of M- many mood disorders come with uh, anxiety symptoms so i would say boiling it down to its essence is that this is a really good treatment for anxiety mm. quite how you get to that can be through different avenues and routes um you know I feel that actually there there is a bigger story to to play here that you know we have you know an innate endocannabinoid system which evolved around the same time as a human nervous system and mm. so naturally if you have illness that affects nervous systems then it can, cannabinoids can be of benefit there um so there these are immunomodulators as well you know there's all sorts of um you know, sort of branches that this endocannabinoid system has come to. Um, and so it's not surprising that you've got one treatment that can affect many, many different ailments. Um, the evidence is great for anxiety at the moment, but actually this is like opening Pandora's box. You know, we, we've got this fabulous array of tools um, to, to try and help ease suffering, treat disease, and possibly find cures. At the moment, cannabis isn't a cure for anything. You know, we're not saying this can cure X, but potentially there are avenues which could be open to research and people are doing research which which could lead in that direction. Mm. Um, so it's it's a very exciting and, and novel field. And many of my colleagues don't know that there is an endocannabinoid system. We weren't taught that in, in medical school. The endocannabinoid system truly has only been um, recognized for the past sort of 30 years that's within the you know the the lifespan of someone's career whereas you know humans have known about you know cannabis as a medicine for at least 5,000 years documented and, and quite possibly many 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 you know eons before that um, way before even you know cannabis became a a, a genus of, of plant species and many other uh, plants have 
cannabinoids within them as well. It's mm -hmm. it's not that this is a unique um, uh, plant that produces something that is not found anywhere else in nature. Mm. You know, we're surrounded by cannabinoids all the time. We have cannabinoids within our body, which you know mm. that's that's just part of our makeup and, and the mechanisms. And there's some fascinating research going on about you know endocannabinoid deficiency. You know, are some of our illnesses actually because of this innate system that's hardwired into pretty much every cell of our body uh, going wrong. And th those are fascinating areas. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I'm very excited to be in this field. Um, we just perhaps need, you know, the, the research base to catch up with what we and patients in general have, have found. I mean, many people know innately that, you know, cannabis as a source of phytocannabinoids is beneficial to them and you know the, the number one thing you must do with patients is listen to them you know they they know largely you know what what works for them and and as an unlicensed medicine without the evidence base without the research having been done that tells you well this particular profile this you know chemovar will help you in this way um you know the patients have to be the ones doing these you know N equals one experiments. You know, patients are experimenting on themselves. But fortunately, um, you know, these are particularly safe medicines. They're not 100% safe. There's mm. definitely reasons why you should not have them. And there's definitely reasons why you need medical supervision. But compared to many, many of the medications I was prescribing, you know, not every day, every hour, every other minute in the, in the NHS, you know, but we tolerate those risks. Mm. You know, these are quantifiable, you know, known risks. We say, yes, we know from the evidence base that there are benefits and we know these benefits, but we also know that there are risks and we can quantify those risks and we can try and minimize those risks. And and that's what, you know, the the profession uh, leads to. It leads to expert, professional, multidisciplinary risk taking. But at the end of the day, it is risk taking. And, you know, this is no different. And that's why it's important to have, you know, uh, highly skilled, experienced, professional oversight of people who have complex medical needs. And that, that will always be the case, even if, you know, cannabis was you know, made legal as and available as in some other countries. Mm. Like Many alcohol, just, just generally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there would still be a need for particularly complex people to have medical oversight. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to that that point about even if uh, it was legal, because that's that's actually a really interesting hypothetical. But um, before I do, oh, hello, Dexter. Before I do, <laughs> what, what are, you you mentioned risks that you wouldn't take, or you mentioned there's there's reasons why you wouldn't prescribe. Can you can you touch on that a little bit? Because I think that comes up a lot. Why? Uh, you, say, you know, if you've got anxiety and you've, you've tried other medications, irrespective, you know, and there has to be a diagnosis, but irrespective of what that diagnosis is, you can potentially help that person. That's that's what you were saying before. Uh, but why would you potentially not want to progress with a patient? Um, let's say I've been a, a psychiatrist for for many many years. Mm. I've seen you know patients who really should not have cannabis. You know, I've seen patients who. Um, we we have on the wards who are very very unwell, and they go on leave, and they they take cannabis, rightly or wrongly, mm. and they come back, and you know you're you're scraping them off the ceiling because they are that unwell and disturbed, mm. and you know potentially floridly psychotic in a very medical sense of the word, in that they have you know hallucinations and delusions and disturbance which you know, really needs extreme measures to manage. Um, there are people who should not have cannabis. Um, mm -hmm. And that that's my professional opinion. And yet it's it's interesting that very often those same people will go back to it time and time again. Yeah. So there, there is something about an endocannabinoid system which that profile of patient seeks out. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand why that is. Mm -hmm. um, there are people certainly who um, we... we don't know the risk. So say if you were uh, very uh, young, or if you are pregnant, or if you are breastfeeding, mm -hmm. then we don't know the impact that that has on these, um, you know, developing bodies and brains. So those are people who 
I think the the balance of risk benefit has to be very carefully measured. Yes. Um, not to say that in all instances that should be excluded. Mm. It's risk benefit again. Mm. Um, you know, there are people who who certainly misuse cannabis, and we know that there are people who um, use recreationally. Maybe that started off in a medicinal way, but it escalates and goes up and up and up. And those are people who, in my opinion, aren't getting any additional medical benefit from these phytocannabinoids because the body's very clever. You know, very quickly, the body will just downregulate all the endocannabinoid receptors in your body. Yeah. So you're, you're just, you know, piling more and more on and becoming more and more tolerant. Um, you know, not unlike in the, the same way, say, if, if you had alcohol, you become very, very tolerant and ultimately, you know, end up on, you know, bottles of spirits every day. And then you withdraw that and the person can have very dangerous, life threatening symptoms. Now, with cannabis, you withdraw it and people, you know, not unlike, say, heroin will experience distress and unpleasant side effects, but they won't die, mm. um, unlike with, with alcohol. Mm. Um, so there, there's a, a difference of risk profile there for very high use. Um, but those are people who, uh, through the addiction model, you know, their world has become very centralized on, on cannabis, seeking, using, you know, they, they let, have a salience. It becomes the most important thing in their life. They neglect um, their, their social relationships. It can impact their work. Mm. It can impact their finances. You know, these are very expensive products at the end of the day so there are very negative consequences and the model of addiction is you continue to use a reward inducing uh substance despite the negative things happening in your life mm -hmm. and so yes there are cannabis use disorders we have to be very sort of careful of as well and encourage patients to seek the appropriate treatment to manage those um addictions um because any rewarding uh, activity can become an addiction Mm. Um, you know, I suppose you, you can even think, you know, hypothetically that people who exercise a lot and exercise has been linked with endocannabinoid, um, release, mm -hmm. um, you know, could be considered to be, you know, doing so in a rewarding way because of endocannabinoids. Mm -hmm. Um, but we don't, you know, sort of take people who run marathons into treatment and substance yeah. use centers. Well, they're generally quite healthy. Well, 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 yeah. You sometimes have to stop him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> good. I mean, maybe there's something to be said for, maybe we should be having a look at some of these peak athletes and their physical health is very good, but is the mental health matching up? That's an interesting uh, study we could do potentially. Um, yeah, really interesting. And I think really important people understand that, you know, it can have a negative side effect. Uh, or negative negative effects on people in general, or just not be a positive thing for individuals. So, just thinking about um, you know medical reasons why people shouldn't necessarily have cannabis. You know, we know that mm. um, you know, cannabinoids can have effects on things like heart rate and blood pressure, and so you would want to be particularly careful with people who you know might have cardiovascular disease, say. Um, mm. On the flip side, there, there is some evidence that you know, cannabinoids can be helpful for um, anoxic states, so states whereby there has been um, a lack of oxygen to certain organs, whether that's heart or brain, um, and cannabinoids can have a protective effect. Again, these are typically preclinical studies, um, but there's, there's promise there as well. Um, you know, CBD, I'm a massive fan of. Um, there's some evidence that that has neuroprotective, neuroregenerative effects. And so the potential implications for um, neurological illness, I think, uh, is, is immense there as well. And so far, we're just touching on two cannabinoids um, out of, you know, what may be 150 plus. So, you know, the, this is a treasure trove. It's an absolute treasure trove of potential medicine, um, mm. which links in with a, a, an evolutionarily uh, primitive system within our bodies. You know, we're, we're, we're linked with jellyfish. You know, jellyfish from 600 million years ago have endocannabinoid systems. I Do think that's actually? utterly amazing. 
Um, you know, ours are slightly more sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> reassuring. I feel better. I was, yeah. I was starting to feel a bit uh, in, in insecure there. Is it really related to these things? Okay. Um, but yeah, fast. I have to say to people like the there's a sort of people get very enthusiastic about cannabis being uh, almost like religious about it. Like, oh, what an incredible thing that nature's given us. And I think it's it's more that we sort of picked it up and said, actually, that that's fantastic. Let's breed that and make that the best thing it can be because that that realization that it's locking into something and then and then amplifying that. I just want to go back to to talking about. Um, those more difficult patients that you potentially have to say no to. And, um, and I suppose they're coming to you often having been using cannabis already, uh, illegally. So I suppose there's that the, the counter argument, I suppose, is that harm reduction factor of if someone's using cannabis illegally and they have severe mental health, is it not a better thing to, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Is it not a better thing to give them a legal regulated supply or is that still, you know, I, it, you know, that risk is still too high. What do you what do you say to that sort of person? I suppose you you say stop stop taking cannabis. Um, I would want them to be using medical cannabis, and if they are eligible, that's what I would be prescribing. There there are a subsection of people who who have ramped up, you know, their tolerance to such a level that, you know, in 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 all honesty, I I can't prescribe that level of cannabis to a person. Mm. You know, I would encourage them to to enter substance misuse. Mm. services to try and get that down and there are some great strategies which we go through with people to to get them down and one of them is just being legal they no longer feel that they they have to use it in the manner that they have been using it and mm. a lot of people you know just come down very naturally they start off at a bit of a peak and everyone gets excited and you know they they want to have lots of cannabis and then eventually it's kind of like oh well this is actually just medicine you know i, I just put my order in every month and I, I get it and i use it and I get on with my life. So actually just the, the legality and the market of it is, is kind of self-regulating. But there'll always be outliers. There, there absolutely will. Um, and we have to think, well, how do we manage those people? And the people who say, you know, are prone to psychosis coming and saying, well, I'm using anyway, you need to give me some of this because that would be safer. Mm. Um, I, there is a role for medicine in this. I don't think we're here yet. I think that needs a, a, a very coordinated, uh, multidisciplinary team approach from mm. uh, a team of people. At the moment, the industry is quite fragmented and we don't have that, that joined up holistic, you know, sort of biopsychosocial environmental support for someone mm. going through that. Mm. Um, so essentially we we need to go for the the low hanging fruit and there is so much low hanging fruit there and and ultimately build our um expertise to manage that mm -hmm. you know we we can't solve every problem straight out the gate and it'd be naive to think we could mm -hmm. yeah good point good point it's there's a lot of people to help in a lot of ways and and some are more difficult and and more complicated than others and i suppose there's a limited amount of us here doing this work and um a limited number of, of doctors as you say so you can't put together these uh these complex teams of support that you might need for someone like that yeah yeah fascinating so there's so much potential here what's the, i suppose pro prohibition aside illegality aside now we've now we've moved over that hurdle at least in the united kingdom and, and and you know other countries besides what are the reasons why this isn't moving forward as as fast as one might hope why are we not uh seeing the nhs pick it up why are we not seeing more doctors pick it up do you think that's a question to either of you. It might be less of a clinical question and more of a social question. I don't know if... Uh... I, I think the message. I think we're still having... I think when we first started the clinic, I'd be picking up phone calls, inquiries from people who already um, had access to cannabis. And the, the thing I'd love is, uh, be, I just found out it's legal. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, two and a half years on, those calls are becoming less and less. So hmm. I think... The message is getting out to people who are already medicating with cannabis. I don't think we've, we've done with our work there at all with the cannabis community. I think there's still a lot of people out there and little misconceptions about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's we're getting the message there. But then I think for people who have had no experience of cannabis, no contact with cannabis, um, have quite a negative view of cannabis, um, the message isn't getting out to them. 
Uh, And it's a really difficult hurdle um, how to do it because we get patient stories out in national newspapers. They're on page 17. Do you know what I mean? Um, You you try and engage with media and the big media places that really picking up on it. Um, So I think Mm -hmm. for me this year, um, we're going to continue to be out there with the cannabis community, but um, I'm going to do more uh, local things with different groups of people who are not cannabis aware. And I, I think as, sure. as though it's going to be little bits of people, but if we just start that message and then they speak to their family and they say, oh, I saw this woman and she she showed me you don't have to smoke cannabis and, and she showed me and she talked to me how it helps with X, Y, Z or how, why she takes it and she doesn't look like that stoner type. Mm. And do you know what I mean? And I, I, that's the work I'm doing locally now with groups. But I think it's getting the message out more and more and getting acceptance. Yeah, yeah. Awareness and acceptance. I've, I've been hammering that home in God, every single meeting I'm in at this point. Awareness and acceptance. Uh, and this, the latter, because the awareness one's the obvious one. We all know that there's a problem with just generally getting the word out and uh, misconceptions, which you mentioned earlier, which would be really interesting to touch on. And what did you exactly mean there? Um, but yeah, the uh, the acceptance as well. We need people to hear it, but also go, oh yeah, I'll get some medicine. Okay. And just get on with their lives, I suppose, and not take issue with that. And we do, we do see that. When you said misconceptions, can you give us some examples? What are the sort of misconceptions of what, what do people think you're doing that you're not? Or what do you think? I think the first misconception is we we come across a lot of patients that come through who have disengaged with services. They've gone to GPs, Mm. they've had, I mean, we're talking mental health now. Um, They've had no luck with the the medications that they keep getting prescribed. They don't suit them. They they come to the conclusion, I don't want pharmaceuticals. They don't get referred on to secondary mental health, which perhaps some of them would really, really benefit from. So they are sort of disengaged. So the misconceptions about, doctors and what they can do to help so i think that that's one aspect of it mm. i think another as- aspect of it is a misconception about the consistency and quality of the medication coming through and to be fair you know i've been a patient for over two years and in the beginning there were some questionable products coming through but now the range of products that are coming through uh is such good quality and consistency mm. um and you know like I've, I've traveled other places where i've had access to to cannabis recently um which you would call adult use cannabis and, and i think a lot of it well some of it is definitely on par uh, with it um and i think getting that message out there that it isn't a poorer quality to to other options um in the legacy community and and i do acknowledge and i will openly acknowledge that there are some absolutely talented expert cultivators within the legacy community um um, i've i don't get my hands on that i didn't get my hands on that before i went legal but i know it's there do you know what i mean so i do acknowledge and i do understand when patients say to me but this is and this and i understand yeah all right you get better cured you've got better Mm. you haven't got as much transit time Mm. so but Mm. i think the 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 cultivators and the producers, they're doing a lot better job. And I think the stuff that we're getting through now it is of a great quality. So I think getting rid of that misconception and the price as well. I mean, I constantly speak to people going, what are you paying for an eighth? You know, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, the lowest I've found people paying for an eight, eighth is just about six pounds, you know. So we're competing on price. Mm. Uh, and, and believe me, I've come, people pay a lot more for an eighth. You know, I, I would say, roughly it'd be about the 40 pound mark for, for an eight 3.5 grams um so yeah we're competing on price as well and then i think getting to that that idea that it's actually beneficial to speak to a doctor or a, a nurse or a pharmacist and about your medication and get the information there there's a lot of misconceptions out there about the medication itself and what mm. you can do mm. so that, that's what i think about the misconceptions how, how about you dave what do you struggle with i suppose on the on the clinical side of things, what are the misconceptions from from other doctors that you speak to who aren't in cannabis? Um, there's, you know, doctors are humans, and there's been you know a, a propaganda war against this for you know a lifetime. Mm. You know, so many people have known no other narrative than cannabis as a substance of misuse. Mm -hmm. and you know we're trying to challenge that is is difficult i think you know vast steps have been made however in 2018 when it became legal 
the the majority opinion i think within the medical profession was that it was a substance of misuse there wasn't that that knowledge uh, an attitude out there and there was no incentive to learn that there was any different way of thinking about about cannabis and you know you, you put your head down and you get on with the the work you're trained to do and it's rewarding and you're helping people um for someone to say well you know you were actually you know misinformed about this the whole time um is is a difficult pill to swallow for for many people um you know, it creates a, a dissonance. There's a, a psychological concept called cognitive dissonance. If your behaviors and thoughts are misaligned, it causes intrapsychic stress. Mm. And nobody likes that. So you have to change one or the other. You have to either change your, your thinking about things or your behaviors. And so nobody likes to be in a stressful situation. So it's very good to use the psychological defense mechanisms of things like denial. You know, say, so, well, that can't be the case. You know, that's that's not what I know. That's not what I understand. And so, you know, it, it takes a, a long time for people's thoughts and attitudes to change. And, you know, we're just one brick in the wall of you know, creating that narrative. And and it is a, it's a story. It's a narrative that has to get out there. And and, you know, healthcare professionals listen to patients. You may not think we do, but we, we definitely <laughs> do. And behind closed doors, we talk to each other as well. Um, but to, to get to that groundswell whereby it becomes uh, an acceptable thing to, to say out loud um, it is, is a step. And it, it takes leadership from high places. And so you, you need things like the Royal Colleges to come on board with this. Um, you know, I, early in my um, sort of education of this, I did speak to, you know, people from the Royal College of Psychiatrists and gave a couple of presentations and things. And, you know, that's that's one step. But, you know, it, it takes a lot for that to move forward. You know, I, I talked to my colleagues about wanting to do research in this area. And, you know, that was a, a very difficult thing to try and do and, and would have taken, you know, a, a massive upheaval of of what I was doing. My job plan was to see patients and do what I was trained to do, not to branch off and, and start doing the whole other world, research, isn't it? Clinical research. Whereby that there isn't the, the funding to do that, which yeah. is another sort of strand to that. Yeah, good point. Point. Yeah. Um I suppose what I hear what I'm hearing, I suppose from you guys, but also what I hear generally day to day is the the, the way to convince these these healthcare professionals is to actually show them the difference that it makes to patients' lives, um, and I suppose you know, put you on the spot. What what are the the biggest sort of or best? You, you know, you mentioned the word narrative. What are the best examples you can give of uh, you know impact in terms of a real world day to day lifestyle impact that these medicines can have? Uh, you know, we we talk to chronic pain doctors, and they say, well, patients you know who were cyclists and stopped because of a back issue get back on the bike and are able to you know re-engage with something they used to love what's the psychiatric equivalent i suppose um house cleaning <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do yeah, hear I'll, that a lot you do hear that a lot i'll, I'll pick up on that um because that that was something which bowled me over yeah. uh, is um yeah adhd I mean, the, the evidence academic evidence base isn't isn't great for it but you know through treating people with anxiety and adhd that the response has has been quite phenomenal hmm. and the one thing that almost every person with ADHD tells me is when I take cannabis I can now do my housework mm. it's like who knew cannabis led to housework it's it's, <laughs> a, way it's a great way drug yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going yeah. there that's brilliant but it's I, you do you hear it all the time I got up yeah. and I did my hoovering I was out in the garden doing my gardening and I had a great day and I got some stuff done and I feel really good about myself that uh I think everyone can resonate with that to some extent I think everyone has days where that's difficult and that you know i do think there's it's a great use as a tool alongside you know complementary therapies mm. um you know anxiety people who are unable to leave the house due to that crippling anxiety and struggle to you know go to the shops and do all their shopping online now mm. you know say I, I can now go to the shops i can now you know go go meet my friends and spend some time at an event because I know I've got my medicine and I can go outside and I can come back in and I'm not fearing persecution and arrest. 
Mm. Um, so there are people with, say, PTSD who, you know, don't don't engage with the therapies that will really solve their problems like EMDR and trauma-focused CBT because it's too traumatic, but with some cannabis on board can actually get to do those therapies. Mm. So it's an adjunct in those senses um, whereby they would not have been able to do that before. And my understanding, and, um, you know, I'm, I, I've talked to psychologists about this, that they don't feel that the cannabis will interfere with the, the consolidation of that therapy. Um, again, it's a very, very early stage. So if people are taking things like benzodiazepines, that could interfere with the consolidation of the therapy into um, you know, long-term benefits. That doesn't seem to be the case with cannabis. So it, it, it's an adjunct. It's something to help people get back into therapy and lives and living and exposing themselves to things that they would find otherwise too traumatic. A recovery aid, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Which is that sort of an adjunct is in many ways, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, it's it's fantastic to hear these things. I could honestly um, you know, you could regale me with these anecdotes all day long and I would I would lap it all up. Unfortunately we do we do have a time limit on these things. Um I you know honestly could talk to you guys for the rest of the day. Um thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, you know, I I know incredibly busy you guys are day to day. Um it's been brilliant. It's been really interesting. Is there any last final thoughts for those who are watching, whether it's the general public, other doctors who might be watching this? I would say, you know, uh, please get involved with, you know, cannabis in any way, you know, you, you feel you're able to. As a patient, get in touch with a clinic, talk to people about it, attend an event, watch, you know, webinars and research this yourselves. For, for doctors and healthcare professionals who are interested, yeah, do do try and talk about this in your your daily you know working lives. You know there there are more and more people who are interested and fascinated by this subject because it is it's a fascinating subject mm. and the potential benefits that this could lead to for patients is phenomenal and and that's what we're all here to do. That's why people go into healthcare is to help patients. And, you know, you're, you're missing out on, you know, a, a vital tool in the armory if you're ignoring the endocannabinoid system. Mm-hmm. Well put. Any, any final thoughts from you, Sam? Um, I just um, think create our own community. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have to acknowledge that as patient numbers grow, which I believe is going to grow significantly over the coming months, years, that we have to get our own places to go. And I know we've talked about this before, Alex, but encouraging patients and other people in the community to start their own businesses. You know, people say all the time, I want to get in this business. How do you do it? Well, we're so in the infancy. I don't know what's in your head and what you're going to invent, Mm. which is going to be a fantastic business idea. So Mm. go on. Think about it. I mean, we've we've done some. I've done some work uh, with uh, medical cannabis lounges and encouraging people to do that. And yeah, whatever you want, just go out there and create something for patients. Because as patients, I want places to go, and I want to go and find joy and connect with other people. Brilliant, brilliant. I couldn't agree more. And I think we're going to see more of that throughout this year. It's something that um, I know you're working on. I'm working on. I think everyone in this industry is, uh, you know, helping to build communities. We're at that stage bit of a tipping point in terms of the patient numbers we were all spread out across the uk and there wasn't enough of us i think now there's enough of us that the, that these things can really become meaningful spaces where you know we can share experiences um and you know help work on further awareness further acceptance so yeah oh yeah fantastic point and and thank you again thank you all of you i won't ask dexter, dexter for a final thought dexter's a bit bored now he's a bit bored already ah oh, poor dexter he wants his w-a-l-k he can't ah, spell I see. yet. I see. He can count to two because he knows if we only give him one treat, he's do another one. But mm. he can't I can't pass two and he can't spell. We're okay. working on it. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. I mean, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you again. Really appreciate your time. Um, we'll put all lots of lovely links to the website and so people can find out more about you guys um, in the in the blurb and the comments and whatnot. Uh, and thank you everybody for watching um, this episode we will be back very shortly I uh, hope you enjoyed let us know what you thought in the comments and uh, see you all very soon take care thank you thank you Alex take care